the two remaining members of Rescue 3 that were in the building, um, Captain Bowen and Firefighter Jay Betancourt. At this point, they're on their knees and they're completely out of air. Captain Bowen's completely out of air. Jay has just a few breaths left. And Captain Bowen um, asked Jay to buddy breathe. They hook up their buddy breathing apparatus. Their air is exhausted very quickly. And Captain Bowen loses consciousness. Stay tuned coming up. It's a flashback to episode 43 and part one of my two-part interview with Asheville Fire Chief Scott Burnett sharing the details of a tragic line-of-duty death of Captain Jeff Bowen. But first, let's hear from our amazing sponsor, Midwest Fire. Midwest Fire, a factory direct manufacturer. That means no middleman. You work directly with the good folks right at their factory in Laverne, Minnesota. If you want to see just how easy it is to design your own Midwest Fire truck, check out the Create a Spec tool on their website. To get started, go to MidwestFire.com and click on the Create a Spec tab at the top of the homepage. Hello and welcome to the Situational Awareness Matters show, episode 340. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high risk, high consequence, time compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming in time to prevent bad outcomes. Today's feature segment is sponsored by Gasaway Virtual Training. We have 33 online training programs for your members. Some of these programs are live events presented virtually, and some of them are pre-recorded programs. To learn more, visit samatters.com website and click on the Virtual Training tab. Okay, let's jump into today's feature segment, a flashback to episode 43 and part one of my two-part interview with Asheville Fire Chief Scott Burnett sharing the details of a tragic line-of-duty death of Captain Jeff Bowen. One note before we begin, this interview was recorded before I was doing the show in a video format as well, so our discussion with Chief Burnett is audio only. That, that we will never forget the Asheville Fire Department. On that day at 12.26 p.m., just after lunchtime, we were dispatched to a report of a fire alarm activation at 445 Biltmore Avenue. 445 Biltmore Avenue was a structure that was seven stories tall. It was in our medical district, and it had a number of medical offices in that property, there were um, 22 medical practices and clinics, and at the time of the fire, there were over 200 occupants. The building was only partially sprinklered. It had one, had two sprinkler heads on the second floor, and they were not involved in the fire. 150,000 square foot building, and it was protected by a fire alarm system, and that is what alerted us to the problem in that building on July 28th. It was the sixth alarm activation that we had responded to in the month of July in 2011. Our first arriving companies... You mean six to that address, in, Scott? What's that? The sixth one to that address? That, that is correct. We had, okay. that, that was the sixth time that we had responded for an automatic alarm activation uh, to 445 Biltmore Avenue in the month okay. of July. Okay. So when our first arriving uh, units arrived on scene, they... Um, reported smoke and flames showing from the top floor and they declared it as a working fire. We had always thought that an alarm activation, particularly in a commercial building during the day that had over 200 people inside that building, that the alarm activation would be followed up by a 911 call, multiple 911 calls, um, if it were an actual fire. We did not receive any other indication that there was a problem in that building other than the automatic alarm activation. We received no 911 calls. All the occupants were evacuating, assuming the fire department would 
was on the way, and we were. So when the working fire was declared, the alarm was upgraded to a structure fire dispatch, which only added two more companies, a battalion chief and a safety officer. The initial response to the alarm activation was two engines, our squad, and a ladder. And the working fire dispatch added our rescue company, added another engine, added a battalion chief and a safety officer. So we had those units also dispatched. The initial company officer asked for a second alarm. That second alarm was missed. And so we were woefully understaffed the first minutes of that fire. What do you mean we missed? Did not get our second alarm. Yes, sir. What do you mean missed? The second alarm was missed. Uh, right. The second alarm was missed. The second alarm was, was um, asked for by the com- first arriving company officer. And the telecommunicator was task saturated. Uh, it was alarm activation. There were other emergencies that that single telecommunicator was managing, um, receiving uh, calls, receiving information about other emergencies going on in the city. And then this alarm activation turns into a structure fire and that telecommunicator gets really busy really quick and so um, all of the tasks that that telecommunicator had to accomplish the request for a second alarm was missed by the telecommunicator okay and it was not only the telecommunicator that missed that it was everyone on scene including myself we all missed that we did not have that second alarm being dispatched i never would have imagined that that many people could have missed something as important as a second alarm transmission Um, there's lots of ears that hear that on the radio and um, we all missed it including myself and it was because we were all task saturated Hmm. and so we were um, understaffed the first um, little bit of of the incident for about the first 15 or 20 minutes it wasn't until the third alarm was called for that we actually got our second alarm units dispatched. Rescue okay. three. Go ahead. <clears throat> what was the total number on the scene? You had two engines, squad, a ladder. Then when they filled out the alarm, a rescue, an engine, a ladder, the battalion chief, and a safety officer. How many total? We had uh, 24 people for the working fire 24 total personnel on scene was that before the third alarm uh, that, that was that was yes that was that was our total for the first um, 20 minutes of the fire we had 24 people that were working that incident okay so that's before the third alarm arrives correct okay go ahead and those 24 people also included myself, who, who technically I was not on the uh, the, the initial alarm or the uh, working fire dispatch. I self dispatched. So I, I was the, the you know that 24 included included myself. Okay. Rescue three um, was dispatched once uh, it was declared a working fire, and that company was um, led by Captain Jeff Bowen. And he had uh, an engineer and two firefighters. Um, however, one firefighter was off of that company um, doing some driver training in the western part of the city. So they responded with a three-person company. When Rescue 3 arrived on scene, they were assigned to do a secondary search. They completed their secondary search. They came out of the building. Um, they replenished their air supply. And their fourth firefighter, Jay Battencourt, who was, had been uh, training, he, he met up with them. He drove his behavior to the scene. So now they were back as a company of four. They also had a member of Engine 1 <coughs> who joined them as well. The uh, the other firefighter from Engine 1 um, was held in rehab due to elevated vital signs. And so um, the, the remaining member of Engine 1 uh, teamed up with Rescue 3. So they went on their second entry as a, as a crew of five. Their, their assignment was to uh, um, continue the secondary search on their second entry into the building. And companies were um, working on fire attack. We were having difficulty getting water 
to the fire. We were unable to get adequate water from the standpipe outlets, from the host outlets in the north stairwell. Command had decided to abandon um, fire attack by using the standpipe outlets and use alternate means of putting water on the fire. Um, we went through multiple attempts at solutions, pumping around the FCC. Um, what we what we landed on as a final option was using um, our ladder truck as a static standpipe, and so we hooked up hoses to the ladder truck and entered the structure through windows from the outside, and uh, got first water on the fire that way. So while this was occurring, Rescue Three, their crew of five, were completing their secondary search, and we started to get a number of radio transmissions that did not add up completely from Captain Bowen. Captain Bowen was was was, was a rock star in our department. He was just an amazing officer. Uh, his decisions weren't questions because questioned because they were always the right decision. Everyone wanted to work with Captain Bowen. Everyone wanted Captain Bowen to be at their fire because he he was he was that good. He always made the right decision at the right time. His his first radio transmission that that should have been a big warning sign for us was that he called command and reported that he could not get water out of the standpipe outlets on the north stairwell. That had already been communicated to everybody on scene. The incident commander had already um, abandoned that plan, and he was going back to that and reporting <clears throat> something that had already been reported. That was not like Captain Bowen at all. He was told that the water supply to the North Stairwell um, was not adequate and that we could not get water from the North Stairwell to abandon that and to come out of the building. He then... Captain Bowen then called um, Engine Company 6, who was operating on the fire, and asked them if they needed any assistance. The, the next transmission, again, he goes back to the north stairwell on his radio transmission saying that, that he needed that attack line charged. And incident commander called back again and said, we cannot get water out of the north stairwell. Go out of the building. And Captain Bowen asked, if car three, which is our safety officer, is attacking the fire, um, which is another unusual transmission for Captain Bowen to make because the safety officer is um, clearly not someone who would be inside uh, on a hose line attacking the fire. It's a single a single uh, staffed resource with one person uh, in, an, in an SUV, and uh, so they, they clearly, clearly would not be inside attacking the fire. So the, these transmissions... Um, were were warning signs that um, uh, we did not pick up on as, as as quickly as we should have. As Rescue Three finally began to exit the building, they were all dangerously low on air, and the engineer and one of the firefighters um, they were told by Captain Bowen to go on out because they had the least amount of air. And Captain Bowen was transferring information to another company officer on the fire floor. He decided, finally, um, after he transmitted that information, he decided to take the, himself and the remaining two members of Rescue 3 down that north stairwell um, to safety. Um, they were low on air. Their low air alarms were going off. And um, Captain Bowen went right by the stairwell exit for reasons that we'll, we'll probably never fully know. The two firefighters that were with Captain Bowen, much to their surprise seeing Captain Bowen go right by the exit, they, they took off after Captain Bowen. He was moving quick and he was moving back toward the fire. They chased after him, and when they finally caught up with him, he was near some patient rooms, and uh, he was bouncing off the walls, and he had um, a very confused look to him. The two firefighters realized that if they were going to get him out, that they would need to take control of Captain Bowen, which they did. As they were exiting, and, and there were um, 
very limited visibility, high heat, heavy smoke conditions that they were in. As they were exiting to get back to the North Stairwell to safety, Captain Bowen freed himself uh, from one of the firefighters. That firefighter um, went to the right when Captain Bowen went to the left. They could not see each other, and so he went to the right, uh, attempting to go after Captain Bowen. He was found by members of um, Engine 6, this, this firefighter was, and they passed him out onto as the platform, and he was completely out of air. So he, his life was narrowly saved by the members of, of Engine 6. The two remaining members of Rescue 3 that were in the building, um, Captain Bowen and Firefighter Jay Betancourt, at this point, they're on their knees and they're completely out of air. Captain Bowen's completely out of air. Jay has just a few breaths left, and Captain Bowen um, asked Jay to buddy breathe. They hook up their buddy breathing apparatus. Their air is exhausted very quickly, and Captain Bowen loses consciousness. Jay Betancourt, he disconnects the buddy breathing apparatus so that he can move more quickly to find an exit. He's unable to find an exit immediately, and he is completely out of air, and he starts to shed PPE, he sheds his helmet, he sheds his face mask, his portable radio. Um, he said that he wanted to, to be as quick and light as possible, and he felt like his equipment was, was starting to fail him. And so he didn't need his mask anymore since he was completely out of air, as an example. And so he discarded that to make himself lighter and to be able to move more quickly. He traveled about 200 feet um, down a hallway, extremely heavy smoke, limited visibility, without respiratory protection. And he finds the door to the south stairwell. When he finds this door, he opens up the door and he finds um, a very good conditions in the stairwell for the first time. He is able to breathe fresh air for the first time. He's able to see light and feel cool air on his face. He takes his axe and he places it next to the door because he wants to be able to find that door again. And rather than rescuing himself and going straight down that stairwell, he goes back, crawls another 200 feet, untenable conditions, no respiratory protection, to get Captain Bowen. This act clearly saved other firefighters' lives because we had firefighters on the fire floor at this time looking for both of them and had Jay Betancourt not rescued Captain Bowen to the safety of the south stairwell, then we certainly would have injured and or lost additional firefighters trying to remove them both from the fire floor. So Jay um, is able to remove Captain Bowen into the south stairwell and um, he goes unconscious um, also in the south stairwell. The pass alarm from Captain Bowen alerts firefighters to the south stairwell and they come in from the third floor and find them both and remove them from the building. Unfortunately, Captain Bowen uh, was brought out in cardiac arrest and transported to the hospital. He was resuscitated, attempted to be resuscitated for about 45 minutes and, uh, and then was uh, declared deceased at that time. Jay Betancourt was flown to a burn center and had um, injuries to his lungs and uh, fortunately has, has been able to uh, recover and, and come back to work and is um, doing very well um, physically for um, going through that type of, of injury and being able to return to work as a firefighter. What what the, uh, what process did you guys go through to try to learn what happened, how it happened, why it happened, and how to prevent it from ever happening again? The line of duty death is an unbelievably painful thing for a fire department to go through. Um, it, it's it's very unique. Every human on the face of this earth has experienced loss. We've all experienced loss of people that are young. We've all experienced loss of people that are very close to us. But but a line of duty death is, is so different than any kind of loss that any of us had experienced before for a lot of different reasons. So because of that, because of that, that pain that, that that we were going through, it was very, very important to our fire department to improve 
mainly because we didn't ever want to go through this again. And so we set out on a journey to improve our department. Our first thought was that we were going to be as hands-off to an investigation or to an evaluation or to an analysis as to what went wrong and what we can do better. We did not want to be in the guts of that because we felt that we would not get the improvement that we wanted because we would be biased. So we, we asked a lot of different groups to come in and do the analysis for us. It became clear early on that, that we were not going to be satisfied with the results from those different groups. They did an outstanding job and gave us some, some really, really good recommendations. However, um, we, we wanted more. We wanted more. And so, so it, was, it was clear that the most benefit that we would have as far as improving our department would come from our own post-incident analysis. We, we reached out to, to you, um, to Dr. Gassaway. Uh, fortunately, we had already established a relationship um, in earlier in 2011. Um, you had, had come and, and shared with us um, some training, some situational awareness training. Mm -hmm. And um, within months, um, we, we had this tragedy, and so we, we were able to uh, reach back out to you to assist us with um, a facilitated debrief, which was very beneficial. That facilitated debrief um, that you led included individual um, sessions, um, small group sessions, a large group session, and we just captured our strengths, our successes, the challenges, and, and opportunities that, that took place as a result of July 28, 2011. What came of that, excuse me, were um, 16 different focus areas. That, hey, um, hey, Scott, we can we stop for one second? Sure, sure. <clears throat> I want to make sure that the listeners understand that this was not a stress debrief. I don't want it to be confused with like a post-incident stress yep. debrief event. This was an operational debrief where the companies got to tell their stories about the how things played out from their individual perspectives and then we just kind of put the whole picture together got it yeah okay 16 so we had um 16 different focus areas that uh, were a result of this facilitated debrief and this was much different than um, a, a critical incident stress management debrief, that type of um, event, which was certainly for a different purpose. This was, this was an operational review um, that, that you led for our department so that we could come up operationally what focus areas that we could improve upon. We came up with those 16 different um, focus areas, and it was everything from air management to, to radio usage, 16 different um, areas that, that were extremely important for us to improve on because we could have done those a lot better on July 28th. There are several of those that we have learned every fire department in the country has the same struggle that we did with these areas. And so when we're talking with other fire departments, we really like to um, focus on those there's six, the big six, um, that seem to be very common throughout the fire service in our country. And, and those six are air management, staffing, critical tasking, mayday training, and health and wellness. Including that critical tasking is both for rapid intervention and the incident management team. And so those are, those are probably the, the, the six biggest areas that we improved on. And we, we've done a lot of, of research in the last three years identifying what are best practices and what are the best for the Asheville Fire Department. And we put those Scott, in play. Hold on just a second. Uh, I was making some notes. And is health and wellness two or one? 
To, are they together or are they separate? Together. Together. All right. Then I only get, only captured five of them. I got air management, staffing, critical tasking, mayday, health and wellness. Which one did I miss? No, you've got them all. But within critical tasking, it's it's um, RIT and incident management. Oh, okay. So critical tasking or rapid intervention and critical tasking of incident management. So. Okay. Yeah, it's five broad categories, but we're the six things to talk about. So. Okay. You want me to restate those in this separate? Nope. Ad RIT? Nope. I'll put them in the show notes, and uh, I I got the notes now. I just I only had five, and I thought, man, I I missed one, and I didn't want to miss one. I got them now. We we put these improvements into play, and they've made a real difference for our department. Um, from July 28, 2011, is sharing the information that we have learned. Um, with as many people as possible in the fire service so that they perhaps won't have to go through what we went through. They can learn from our improvements and make those improvements in their fire department and have better outcomes for the department. It's safer each time they go to a structure fire. So so what are some examples of, you talk about these big six, tell me something you do differently today than you did on July 28th? On July 28th, related to air management. Um, we did not have an air management culture at the Asheville Fire Department. We do today, and it's a very strong culture. What we have found out is very few fire departments have an air management guideline or an air management philosophy. That surprises me now, but we certainly were in that place three years ago. Every fire department needs to have a very strong air management culture. What we operated with up to 2011, our air supply dictated how long we could work. And that was a wrong approach. If we entered a structure, we knew that once our low air alarm went off, it was time to exit. We got away with that for a long time because most of our fires, like every department in the country for the most part, they fight single-family homes. The fires that we have are in single-family homes. And when your air supply gets low, you're within five steps of an exit, and you never have an issue of running out of air. We, we took that culture into a seven-story building that was 150,000 square feet, and we had multiple radio transmissions of firefighters working inside the structure with their vibe alerts going off. We've changed that significantly in that we use the heads-up display as our guide for our air management. We have to have a completely full bottle, which with the style of SCBA that we have is two green lights on our heads-up display inside our mask. And so we don't ever go inside unless we have those two green lights. We have a completely full bottle. And we monitor our work times, which just like we do on a hazmat, which we always did really well on a hazmat incident with an air management officer, we do the same for a structure fire now in that we monitor, okay, how long did it take to get to the location where we're going to work, whether that be to search, whether that be to attack the fire, knowing that we're going to need more than that time to come out and then also how much time is it going to take us to accomplish the task and then how much do we have in reserve if an emergency occurs we always did that really well for hazmat incidents but we never did it for a structure fire now we have a command technician a chief aide that's tracking all of those things on the outside and so when we go in with those um, completely full bottle once we go to amber, which indicates that we have half of our air supply left. We have 4,500 um, PSI cylinders, and so when we get down to 2,000, the LED changes to amber. Once we are at amber, we are leaving the structure at that time. We don't wait for it to turn amber and then leave. We already have that planned, and we are tracked by the command technician, the chief's aide, to let us know when it's time to, to exit because of our air supply. However, once it turns to amber, one member of the company is amber 
then which indicates 2,000 PSI, then the entire company comes out of the structure. If one member of the company or more has their low air alarm activate, which is red on the heads-up display and the vibro alert going off, then the company officer or the firefighter, if someone on that company is going to get on the radio and declare a low air emergency. A low air emergency in our department is a precursor for an RIT deployment. RIT stands up, they get ready to uh, to deploy if that company is not outside within 60 seconds of the low air emergency declaration, then it becomes an RIT activation. RIT goes in and gets the company out of the structure. So that, that level of, of air management culture has made a huge difference in the safety of our firefighters. One big concern that we had going into that was we thought that, well, we're just not going to have enough time to work if we're coming out with half of a bottle. We found that that is certainly not the case. We have adequate work time. We're still putting fires out. Um, we're rotating companies more frequently, and we're doing that, and it's much more safe, but the efficiency and the effectiveness is, is, is not changed at all. Outstanding. <clears throat> what, are, what are some of the staffing changes? One thing that we mistakenly had thought was that minimum staffing meant how many people were assigned to, to an apparatus and that if we had a big fire that people could meet on scene. Minimum staffing, there's no fire department in the country that will tell you we've got enough firefighters. We, we need more firefighters in our companies. We need more firefighters in our departments. We need more firefighters to be able to respond. But when, when we talk about minimum staffing in this context, minimum staffing means minimum staffing. Whatever your department staffs its apparatus, if you, if you meet on scene and POVs, if you um, arrive as a company on the vehicle, whatever it is, that you need to establish what your true minimum staffing is. I, I have have also been a volunteer firefighter um, for a very long time, and, and our uh, members, um, for the most part, meet on scene in POVs. What we would do typically is we would do our training in the evening, and we would have 30, 35 firefighters attend this training session, and we would do a drill with 30 or 35 firefighters. We would go to a fire, and we would have 12 or 15 firefighters. What we should have been doing is doing our training with our true minimum staffing, which was 12 or 15 firefighters on the fire ground. Here at Asheville, that same logic, when we did our training drills, the entire company was there. So if we had four people assigned to a company, we got to the training ground, and we would do an evolution with all four members of the company, including the engineer who would suit up and do a high-rise drill with the company. We'd go to a real fire, and we would short that company to where they would only arrive by three because one of the other ones, uh, like we did on July 28th, were, were out driver training. So we really only arrived. The engineer stayed with the truck to supply the FTC, and so we only had two. So when we did our training, we trained with four firefighters, but we actually operated with two. If we were going to operate that way, then we should have done our training with our true minimum staffing, which was two. And so that's, that was the context of minimum staffing means minimum staffing. No matter what your minimum staffing is, and, and we always advocate for more because we need more, but whatever it is, train with that. If mm -hmm. you're responding with two firefighters, train with only two. If you're responding with four, train with only four. If you're train, responding with 12 or 15 that all arrive on the scene and POVs, train with that and stagger those firefighters out as to true arrival times so that your minimum staffing is, is, is what it really is. If you have more firefighters on the scene after the training for the real fire, that's just gravy. That makes things safer. It makes it more effective. But um, the fire service seems to do it in reverse. We, we train for the absolute maximum that we will ever have rather than the minimum, and that's how we need to, to train. I've, I've seen that so many times play out that way. You know, they set up an evolution and staff it with 30 people, and, and you know they're not going to have 30 people arrive at a scene of a fire right. at all, if, if, if at all, 
certainly not instantly, but then they got this instant, bam, 30 staffing. You got the attack line, the backup line, the search team, the vent team, the rip team. They're all here. You know, it, almost, yeah. you know, it's it, so unrealistic. That's such a, such a powerful point here, Scott. Thank you. The other important thing related to staffing, and this gets into our critical tasking what we did with rapid intervention and our incident management team, there, there is a lot of research and a lot of data on the, the staffing that is needed for fire ground operations. Um, a lot of good, those, those studies have been done. I guess Dallas probably did the first one back in the 1970s, but um, uh, all the way to, uh, to, to the research that was um, uh, completed to, um, to, to accomplish 1710 and 1720, to, to the most recent uh, NIST studies. There's a lot of fire ground studies that talk about staffing. One thing that, that, that has not been explored um, or, or researched as much as the fire ground tasks are the command function and the rapid intervention function. Phoenix did a huge study after Brett Tarver's line of duty death, um, but beyond that, there's not a lot of critical tasking for RIT. And so as, as the fire service, we, we don't have a lot of knowledge base on what is the correct number to staff an RIT with outside of uh, Phoenix uh, groundbreaking research that they did. When it comes to incident command, there, there's even fewer studies as to what is an adequately staffed incident management team for a structure fire. All departments will have an incident commander. Um, most departments will also have a safety officer, and that's typically it for a structure fire. Departments need to have the ability to expand quickly and immediately into division and group supervisor function on the fire ground, even for a single-family structure fire. A single-family structure fire, as long as it's bread and butter, then incident commander and a safety officer, you will get by with that. And we got by with it for a long time. But add one complexity into that fire, and you're going to need a division or a group supervisor. Also, the chief aid role or command technician. That is such an important role. All throughout my fire service career, being a, a, a firefighter here in the South, I knew what a chief aid was and my view of what a chief's aide was in departments in the northeast that were blessed with a lot more staffing than we had in the south then the chief's aide was someone who drove the chief around and that was my understanding of what a chief's aide was i had no understanding of how critical that role is on the fire ground for firefighter safety it, it's um, it's amazing that fire departments operate today without that chief aide or without that command technician role. It's, it's that important. We've been using that for three years, and it's made our fire ground operations so much more safe and so much more efficient having just that one position staffed. Scott, we don't <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to assume that uh, since you created and staffed the command technician position, the feedback that you received from your command-level officers is they feel far less task saturated and far less overwhelmed with information processing because the technician is there to help them. Completely, one hundred percent. It's it's amazing. We 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 in our country, we we have redundancy for many things. We we have our airline industry, um, the the planes, and I know nothing about uh, flying airplanes. But from what I do understand is, is airplanes, for the most part, fly themselves. But yet we still have a pilot, and we also have a co-pilot. And my understanding of the reason that we have that is if there were anything to happen to the pilot, then we still have somebody there that can, can safely land that plane because it's that important because there's hundreds of people on that, that aircraft. Yeah. <clears throat> However, we, we don't do the same thing in the fire service, and there is a huge risk to our firefighters, and we don't have that redundancy. 
the command technician, that chief's aide, I use those terms interchangeably. I'm going to, I'll, I'll switch to command technician because that's what we call it here okay. in Asheville. That command technician role is such a blessing for that incident commander. Thank you again to my guest, Asheville Fire Chief Scott Burnett. Since 2007, SA Matters instructors have helped more than 1,200 organizations and 87,000 individuals improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, aviation workers, oil refinery operators, and more. If you or someone you care about works in a high-risk, high-consequence, decision-making environment, then we are here to help to improve their safety and survival and to help them accomplish the most important mission of all. And that is to go home to the ones who love them. Since the start of the pandemic, I've had some amazing opportunities to present my programs on a virtual platform to groups ranging in size from 6 to 400. Over the past two weeks, I've had the honor of delivering four live virtual programs for the Red Deer Emergency Services in Alberta and a situational awareness program for the University of Maryland's EMS degree program students. It seems like we might be making the turn on returning to our live events, and here's some of the events that we have upcoming. On October 12th, I'll be at the Waconia Fire Department in Waconia, Minnesota, doing a program on mission, vision, and core values. On October 16th, I'll be at the La Crosse Fire Department in La Crosse, Wisconsin, doing a program called Leaders Toolbox, Building Tomorrow's Leaders Today. On October 19th through 21, I'll be at the Clark County Fire District No. 6 in Washington, teaching fire ground situational awareness. November 3rd, I'll be doing a situational awareness and thermal imaging virtual event with Andy Starnes from Insight Training. And on November 17 through 19, I'll be at the Anchorage Fire Department in Anchorage, Alaska, where I'll be doing two programs for firefighters and one program for their communications professionals. Thank you to the organizations who've allowed me to offer virtual training to your team and a special thanks to the departments that are now hosting live events again. If you're interested in hosting a virtual program or a live event, just click on the Contact Us tab at the top of the SA Matters homepage, and I'll give you a call. Finally, remember to check the show notes for how to subscribe to our newsletter and how to follow us on social media. There we share ideas about how to improve situation awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 340 of the Situation Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you again to my guest, Asheville Fire Chief Scott Burnett. Thank you to our amazing platinum sponsor for six years now, Midwest Fire. Thank you to our feature segment sponsor, Gasaway Virtual Training. And thank you to our associate sponsor, Chief Miller. But most importantly, thank you, the listeners and viewers of this show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters Show with Dr. Richard Gassaway. If you're interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit his website, essaymatters.com. If you're interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for a program, or if you would like to be a guest on his show, click the Contact Us tab at the top of the homepage.